Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Muddy and Glory After Action Report. That's right, it's time for some more dispatches from the front lines and this time I took my Imperial Guard to the Manchester Super Major Grand Tournament. Now normally when I go to a tournament I end up running a bit of a meme list and this is because often it is a challenge that has been set by the community. So last time I went to an event I had to run a pure combat Katachan army with all the Katachan regimental doctrines and special characters and it was a ton of fun. By the way if you've not seen that video don't worry I'll link it at the end of this one. But this time the community set me a very different challenge. This time, I was not to run a meme list, but actually a dream list. I had to take try hard guard to an event, and I actually had to try and do as well as I possibly could. And I have to say, this challenge was actually one of the more interesting ones that I had to do because normally when I go to an event and I'm running a bit of a silly list, the pressure is off because I can be like, oh, well, it doesn't matter if I win or lose the games. I can just have fun and I can create this epic moment. Strachan can take on Khan, Marbo can take on Angron, all those kind of awesome things can happen. But this time, I was actually under pressure. I had to do as well as I possibly could do and I had to show what I could do with the new guard codex. And so without further ado, it's time to crack on with today's episode and let's see how I actually managed to perform at the Manchester Super Major Grand Tournament. Now before we get into the nitty gritty detail of the games, I just want to say a quick thank you to Zach and the whole Warhammer Tournaments crew for organising another fantastic event. Everything went seamlessly. It was a really high quality and well run tournament. All the round timings were on point. I never felt like I didn't have enough time, like I was being rushed. But at the same time, I didn't feel like I was hanging around waiting for games to start. I always felt like I had enough time between rounds to reorganize my force. Something as a guard player, I can tell you, was greatly appreciated. And there was plenty of time for lunch. So everything just felt right and it just felt like a really fun event and I didn't have to worry about anything outside of the games that I was playing. Just want to say that Zach and the Warhammer Tournaments crew run some of the biggest and best events in the UK. They're responsible for the LGT, the London Grand Tournament, which I believe is the biggest event in Europe and it's almost rivaling the size of things like LVO and Adepticon in its size and scope. So if you ever get a chance to go to one of their super majors, I highly recommend it. They're really high quality, they're really well run and everything from the terrain and the missions and the pairings is just supremely well broadcast so you know exactly what's happening at every point in the event. So once again I just want to say a big thank you to Zach and his team for running another amazing tournament and I can't wait to go to more of their events in the future. But with all that now said it's time to get to everyone's favorite part of these videos the list overview. So what does a try hard Mordian Glory list actually look like? Well it turns out it's made up of a boatload of infantry, a shed load of tanks and just a little bit of artillery to season the whole thing. But let me take you through specifically what I'd taken in this list. So starting off, of course, I was in an Arcs of Omen detachment and I had not taken any allies today. So there are no allied scions. It was just a single detachment for today. For my regimental doctrine, I had gone for born soldiers. This allows me to auto wound my opponent if I get a six to hit. And because I'm not running any auxilia today, this applies to my entire army. For my compulsory battlefield role selection, I went for heavy support because I'm running a lot of heavy weapon teams and tanks in this list. But getting into the units themselves, I had two Death Corps Marshals, both of which had bolt pistols and power swords. They're free upgrades. There's no reason not to take them over the last pistol and chainsaw that the guy comes with. Now, I then had a command squad and I had given that command squad a pretty typical loadout. I should clarify it is a Cadian command squad, not a platoon one. Now, my officer had a bolt pistol and power sword. Again, free upgrades, just free real estate, why wouldn't you take it? And then I also had a veteran with a plasma gun because I wanted a bit of long range fire support for my command squad. I had a regimental standard, a master vox and a medic. 
On top of all these infantry officers, I had a single tank commander in my 4th HQ slot. This tank commander was equipped with a battle cannon, lance cannon, and two heavy bolters. Now, interestingly, all of my pre-game CP had been spent on my HQ selections. So starting off, I spent one command point to be able to take two Death Corps Marshals. I know a lot of people ask me, Morning Glory, how do you get two Death Corps Marshals in a single list? I thought you could only take one Commandant. In the Arcs of Omen Grand Tournament book, there is a special stratagem called Heroic Support. And for one command point, you can take an extra unit that normally you're only allowed to take one per detachment. So, for example, you're normally only allowed one Space Marine Captain. But if you use Heroic Support, you can take two. And for the Guard, normally you can only take one Senior Officer, one Commandant. But if you use Heroic Support, you can get two. So that's how I got two in the list. But it does cost me a CP to do it. One of those Death Corps Marshals actually was also my Warlord and I'd given him a Warlord trait and I'd gone for Superior Tactical Training. That allows him to know extra orders. Now, normally, Infantry Officers only know Regimental Orders, but Superior Tactical Training allows you to pick another type of order that you don't already know and you can do that as well. So I went for Mechanized Orders. The reason I went for Mechanized Orders over something like Perfectus Orders is because I have a lot of tanks in this list, but if I don't take Superior Tactical Training with Mechanized Orders, I actually only have one tank commander. And that means that my tanks are going to be really limited. They're going to have to stay really close around my tank commander, which is going to affect their tactical flexibility on the board. But by having that extra Death Corps Marshal with the tank orders, this wasn't going to be a problem for me. Typically, how I ran the tanks is I would have two of them with the tank commander and they would operate together in this like smaller battle group and then I would also take the two plasma ones and I would have those with the death core marshal and he would give them reroll ones to hit by gunners kill on sight while still being able to do take aim on the infantry around him as well because they can do two orders being senior officers. But speaking of infantry, let's now move on to the troop choices. This is very straightforward. I took nine squads of infantry. Every single one of them was a Cadian Shock Trooper squad. Every single squad had a sergeant with a drum fed auto gun, a Vox Caster, a Melter gun, and a Plasma gun. This gives me 90 bodies, which is a really strong infantry corps, and it lets me do so much on the battlefield. Honestly, it always boggles my mind when I see guard players going into tournaments and they've only got like 40 or 60 infantry. That is just not enough. In my opinion, as a guard player, if you're trying to win and you really want to go for that gold, you need to be taking enough infantry that you can sacrifice some of them as just a screen to be able to push back enemy deep strikers and combat units. You need enough to be able to do actions and objectives such as boots on the ground and retrieve battlefield data or raising banners. And you also just need enough so that if things go a bit wrong, you've got a little bit of redundancy. Let's say your opponent has a particularly hot shooting phase. He just clears through 30 of your infantry. Well, well, for me, I'm basically just starting off the game with the same amount of infantry as everybody else does. But if you're only running 60 infantry, that's half of your guys gone in one go. You are going to find it really difficult to be able to hold objectives, take objectives, screen and do your secondaries and action. So for me, taking a lot of infantry is a really competitive option. Not to over-labor the point, not to over-egg the pudding, but one thing that my opponents consistently said to me in every single game was just, wow, you seem to have so much stuff. And it's because I'm not running anything overly fancy or complicated. I've got a lot of infantry because they're all just basic squads. And I can tell you now that every single time, one of the biggest problems for my opponent was the fact that no matter how much my infantry they killed, there always seemed to be more coming out of the woodwork. In addition to all of this line infantry, I did have a few specialist infantry as well. So moving on to the elite selection, I had two squads of Death Corps of Krieg combat engineers. These were just basic five-man squads, no upgrades whatsoever, and their job was to be a cheap way of me getting retrieved battlefield data. I needed a unit that could just deep strike in, get the data, and then die. That's all that mattered to me. Now, some of you will notice that these guys are elites and not troops, so the fact there's only five of them in the squad does mean there's a small chance they could fail to retrieve the data. It was a risk I was willing to take and fortunately it paid off because over all of the games, these guys never failed to retrieve the data when I asked them to do it. Small side note here, but if you're curious as to why I picked engineers for this job over something like Scions, it's because they're so cheap. 
Scions cost 55 points for a five-man squad. Engineers cost 40. That's 15 points saved over. That's enough for me to stick a pair of heavy bolters on a tank and have some change left over as well. So engineers are really, really good at being cheap battlefield data retrievers. Now that covers all of my elite infantry, but now let's move on to heavy support. And starting us off strong, I had three heavy weapon squads, each one with three heavy weapon teams and each team with a mortar. This is a full blown mortar pit and it provides me with a really solid amount of indirect fire support. These mortars were an absolutely vital part of my list and a big factor in me winning a lot of my games. I can point directly to several games in this tournament that were won because I had a big old mortar pit. What makes them so strong is it allows me to shoot at units that my opponent is trying to hide. If you rely solely on direct fire weapons like infantry and tanks, then what you tend to find is your opponent can play it very cagey and they'll just hide units. They'll have a little five man squad that's going to sit on their back for the objective the whole game, just scoring them loads of primary points. But if you take a squad of mortars, if you take three squads of mortars and make a big old mortar pit, then nowhere is safe from your firepower. You can just pound them with just 96 shots every single turn. And that will genuinely wipe out most small five-man squads. And it will start doing a lot of chip damage on those bigger and tougher units as well. In addition to the light fire support provided by the mortars, I had some heavy fire support in the form of my Lehman Russes. In total, including the tank commander mentioned previously, I had six Lehman Russ battle tanks in this army. Woo! That is a lot of battle tanks, boys! That is a big old tank core, and it provided me with a huge, huge amount of firepower to bring to bear on my enemies. In this Lehman Russ fleet, I had two with battle cannon, I had two with execution of plasma cannon, and I had one with a Vanquisher cannon. Every single tank had a last cannon in the front and heavy bolter sponsors. And the Vanquisher tank had been upgraded to be a tank ace. And he had the veteran commandeer tank ace, which allows him to know an extra regimental doctrine. And for his extra doctrine, I went for elite sharpshooters. This means that he gets one free inbuilt reroll to hit every single time he fires. And it basically means that that Vanquisher cannon is almost guaranteed to land the hit every single time. Now, unlike my infantry, who performed a variety of battlefield roles and tasks and who are a relatively complex part of my army list, my tanks had one job, and it was brutally simple. They were there to do damage. They were there to kill enemy models, to destroy enemy formations, and to just utterly and completely win me the firefight every single game. If I go into a game and I'm not winning the shooting phase, then something is going wrong. Now that covers all of the units in my list, but let me address the elephant in the room, because I know some people are going to be raising an eyebrow, not at what is in the list, but at what isn't in the list, because this is meant to be a try-hard guard army, but I've not got a Lord Solar, I've not got a Rogal Dawn, and I've not got a Kazakin Bomb. Let me be clear, all of those units are great, very powerful and very competitive. But I didn't include them in my list for a number of reasons. Firstly, I wanted a list that was very simple for me to pilot. If I'm going to a Super Major, which is going to be five games over two days, and I've got to try my damnedest in every single game, then I need something that is simple and straightforward to use. If I'm having to indulge in overly complex schemes and strategies, then by the time I get to game five, my brain is going to be complete mush. But let me tell you, this list was so straightforward for me to pilot that by the time I got to game number five, I didn't feel any brain drain whatsoever. And I'm honestly telling you that I could have played another day or even two of 40k and my brain wouldn't have got tired. I would have probably just got bored playing so many games of 40k back to back in such a small space of time. So this list was fantastic for brain stamina. But building on this idea of simplicity, I wanted to make a list that was not only very powerful, but one that also could be used by newer players in the game and also on the competitive scene. 
One of the problems I've seen people have in the past when they're going to tournaments is they end up taking a list which they've got off the internet or they've watched a YouTube video saying this is the best guard list you can possibly take or the best marine list you can possibly take. And what ends up happening is they go to a tournament, they're not overly familiar with the list, they haven't quite got the nuances of it down and they end up doing much worse than they expected to and they feel kind of bad. What I want to do with this list is go look. This is an army that even if you're new to guard, even if you're new to tournaments, you can take this and it's so straightforward that you don't have to worry about trying to combo X with Y and Z or one, two, three. None of that is on your radar. All you need to do is basically move your infantry onto objectives, blast the enemy with your tanks, and if they try and hide anything, hit them with the mortars. And there was one other reason that I built the list this way, which is... Sometimes as competitive or meta players, it can be easy to get sucked in and just focused on what is the most 4D chess brain bursting maneuver and combination that you can possibly come up with. But actually it's important to take a step back and look at the fundamental principles that make guard great. There are three pillars that go into every good guard list. Infantry, tanks, and a little bit of artillery. And if you stick to those core principles, then you'll find it difficult to build a bad list. And if you learn anything from today's video, it should be that you don't need to worry about chasing the meta or worrying about what the latest hotness is. Sometimes just getting the basics right will give you a really strong head start in a competitive environment. Now that covers the army list, but now let's get into the lay of the land. What was the terrain like at the event and how competitive overall was the tournament? Overall, the terrain at the Manchester GT was fantastic. The density of terrain was exactly right, I felt, and the types of terrain that were used in each game were both very consistent, but also quite varied. Now, on the surface, it just looks like a bunch of L-shaped ruins, but there's actually three different kinds of ruins in play here. You've got the really large three-story ones that have got a big square base, and they are in each player's deployment zone, and that allows you to hide some of your more important units and protect you against certain alpha strikes. You then also have a two-story ruin which has got some windows in it and this is used often in the mid board. It allows you to get a little bit of line of sight blocking trade in there. It is obscuring and it does create some fire lanes but it also means that if you move into that terrain piece and you touch it you can start shooting out of those windows. So it both blocks line of sight but could also be used to get the drop on your opponent if you manage to sneak into one of those windows. You've then got the third kind of room which is a one story ruin which has a base. This is the one you can see here in the bottom right of this picture. Now this terrain is not obscuring. It's not infinitely tall line of sight blocking. So if you put a tall unit behind one of those ruins, it can be seen. So things like Hecaton Land Fortress and stuff actually have to be a little bit more careful, but it's perfect for hiding your infantry in. You also have a little bit of dense terrain in the form of small ruined walls. And when you take all of this and put it together, you have really, really good terrain for a competitive environment. It's functional and clear in what it does, but it's also varied and interesting. And most importantly, it's not too dense. It's just dense enough that you can hide most of your army. Even a big army like mine was successfully hidden behind ruins most of the time, which allows you to avoid just getting blown off the table turn one. But it's also light enough so that there are genuine multiple angles of approach and often... The objectives are out in the open. You might be able to hold one or two of them from hiding behind a ruin, but the rest of the time, you're going to have to go out there. You're going to have to take risks. You're going to have to expose units, and you're going to have to put quite a lot on the line if you want to get those important midfield objectives. Little side note here about the terrain. All of it is pre set and at the beginning of the tournament the TOs give every single player a small booklet which explains the terrain types and the missions but also gives you not only the map where the objectives are meant to be but also a map with where the terrain is meant to be set up as well and it's all got measurements so you know exactly where each terrain piece is meant to be. This is so useful as it means that even if terrain gets nudged in between games you can spend five minutes before both players stop rolling dice and together you can work out exactly what the board is meant to look like and it makes sure that everything is fair and consistent across games. So in short, the terrain was on point, really, really good. But how competitive was this event? What were the lists and players like? 
Well, guys, it's a super major. It's a big event that attracts some of the biggest and most skilled names in competitive 40k. I can say overall that the competitive standard of this event was very, very high. I wouldn't describe it as an absolute shark tank, but I would describe it as a competitive event. Now, the reason it's not an absolute shark tank is because the funny thing about super majors is they're almost like a paradox. There's a yin and a yang. They're big events that earn players a lot of ITC points and stuff like that. So you do get a lot of very, very good players turning up who want to smash it. But there's so many people there. This was a 250 plus person event that you are undoubtedly going to get a few people that are just turning up for fun and for memes. There was one Imperial Guard guy there who ran a list of two Bane Blades and three Medusas just cause. It was epic and he came stone cold last but it didn't matter because he was just having a whale of a time. So you do get quite a variety of players, but I would say overall that those people that are just turning up for a laugh and bringing the meme lists and just having beers and treating it as a social, they are in the minority. I would say at best, 20% of the players make up that part of the base. And then you've got about 60% of the players that are turning up who might not have been to a tournament before or they've been to one or two events, but they are bringing their A game and they are playing with as good lists as they know how to build and they're trying to win. And then you've got the last 20%, which is made up of the absolute cutthroat players, the ones that you see winning these huge things like LVO, LGT, Adepticon and stuff like that. So overall, the player skill was pretty high and this was represented in the kind of factions that people had decided to use and turn up with. I looked around the gaming hall and it was just a sea of guard and marines, specifically dark angels and world eaters and chaos demons and Votan. And there was a sprinkling of Tau in there as well. There were very few players that were turning up with subpar factions. And when you had a chance to look at the units that other players were bringing, maybe you could glance over at the guy that's playing on the table next to you. You could tell that most people had done their homework. So, for example, I was probably one of the only guard players, like me and that Baneblade guy, that had turned up without the Lord Solar. Every other guard army and their mums apparently had a Lord Solar. Likewise, you'd look over at a Votan list and you'd always see one to two Hecaton land fortresses. Marines universally we're using things like desolators which are actually really powerful at the moment so people had done the homework they turned up with good armies and they'd also made sure that they brought pretty good units within those lists as well so yeah in summary lay of the land pretty bloody competitive good terrain with good missions players which had a high level of skill and very decent army lists Overall, it looked like it was going to be a really strong event. But that covers all the pre-game stuff. Now it's time to get to the bit you've all been waiting for. Game number one. So game number one starts us off strong with Andy and his Imperial Knights. Now I'm not going to lie to you guys. Imperial Knights are not in a great place right now. And this is a pretty good matchup for me. Imperial Knights are alright. And you'll still see them turning up to events and winning games. Because... At the end of the day, as a faction as a whole, they're a skew list. If you don't have enough anti-tank, the knights will just roll over you. But they also tend to fall apart the moment someone does have enough anti-tank to deal with them. And guard especially tend to do all right into knights because for every knight that they bring, we typically can take a Lehman Russ. And then on top of that... We have all of our infantry as well. And sure, the tank has a lot of firepower and a lot of wounds... But it's only Toughness 8, the same as the Lehman Russ, and they've only got a 3 plus save. And the Lehman Russ has actually got a 2 plus save. So in many cases, you'll find that the Lehman Russ can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Imperial Knight in a firefight and do alright. And if you have a pair of Lehman Russes, then that firefight tends to be very much in the guard player's favour. But the game was not a foregone conclusion by any means. I mean, at the end of the day, it is a dice game. Things can go either way. Now, the mission we were playing was Secure Missing Artifacts. And for secondaries, I took Bring It Down. I'm playing against Knights. It's an easy choice. I took Boots on the Ground and Inflexible Command. And he took Bring It Down because he saw how many Lehman Russes I had. And he took Yield No Ground, which is a Knight-specific one, where basically, as long as they don't, 
move backwards they get points it's kind of cool i like it and he also took grind them down because he thought well i've got a lot of infantry there so i should be able to pick up a couple of infantry squads and as long as i don't lose too many knights i'll be all right in terms of deployment it was pretty simple for both players and he doesn't need to worry about terrain all that much because he's knights and i'm going to be able to see him one way or another so he just deploys on the line and just goes for it and in terms of my deployment i need to be a little bit more careful even though I do have the advantage in firepower, I don't want to let Andy blow me off the table in a turn or two. So what I did is I put most of my infantry well hidden out of line of sight behind ruins in terrain so that the opponents couldn't see them. And then I had four of my Lehman Russes, my long range ones, as far back as possible in the big L-shaped ruin that you can see right now. And then I had two Lehman Russes that I couldn't really hide. So I kind of stuck those out. Now, you might think it's a bit crazy for me to like stick them out in the open. But the reason I did this is I actually kind of wanted to bait Andy into coming forward. You see, I was pretty confident that even if I lost both of those Russes, the fact that I still have four Lehman Russes and I'd have 90 infantry and I can put take aim on my infantry and I've got born soldiers so I can kick those knights down to a fourth save against just my las guns alone it means that if Andy over commits and overexpose himself I can then get a turn one drop on him and do lots of damage to him or if Andy plays it a bit cagely then it's like fine I've still got plenty of Lehman Russ left over you're gonna have to come out at some point you can't hide your big knights so I'm gonna get to shoot you one way or another I should have mentioned this earlier but Andy's list consisted of three of the big knights he had one with the battle cannon and the gatling cannon he had one with a battle cannon and a chainsword and then he had another one that had a big laser gun i think it was a preceptor and it had a chainsword as well now that laser gun was actually the one that i was most worried about because it had the big ap and the big damage to actually threaten my russes i'm not so worried about the battle cannons or the gatling guns they're only ap2 I've got a four up save. I've got the toughness to be able to weather most of the damage. But that big laser gun was a Lehman Russ killer through and through. He then also had four baby knights. He had two of the ones that come with the double auto cannon. Genuinely not worried about those even slightly. I've had many auto cannon knights shoot into my Russes and do no damage. And then he had two of the, I believe, called Helverins, the ones that come with the melter guns and the chainsaws. I was actually more worried about the Helverins because they've got the melter and they've got the AP where they can really start slicing through my Lehman Russ armor. And Make no mistake, this was going to be a battle of armor. It was going to be the Imperial Tank Corps versus the Noble Knight Houses. And whoever managed to win that firefight was going to win the game. So once we had gone through lists and we had deployed, it was time to see who was going to get the first turn. And Andy actually won the roll-off. This was really good for him because if I win the roll-off, I can bring all six of my Lehman Russes to bear turn one. And there's a really good chance that I'm going to be able to down two or more of his knights, be they big ones or little ones. So he got the first turn, which gave him a good advantage. And his first turn was pretty straightforward, guys. He moved forward as far as he could go and he unleashed all of his big knights into my two Lehman Russes that were exposed and he was able to kill both of them. So he ended up picking up both of my basic battle cannon tanks. I'm not going to lie, whilst I had prepared for the eventuality that he would kill both tanks, it was still a bit of a shock seeing how much firepower these things could put out. And it reminded me that you should never underestimate Imperial Knights. They still have definitely got some teeth. Unfortunately, Andy had kind of done what I wanted him to. If he had stayed back a little bit and blown away my two Lehman Russes, that would have been better for him. But he decided to go balls deep, balls to the wall, and he went really far forward. This unfortunately meant that my infantry that were hiding in the ruins in the bottom left flank of my deployment zone were able to jump out 30 infantry straight away, melter guns in range, everyone else in rapid fire range, Everyone would take aim and they were able to really start laying the hurt down onto his Imperial Knights. I don't know if Andy thought that the infantry wouldn't do very much to him, but Born Soldiers is going to Born Soldier and 
infantry can stack on a lot of auto wounds. Now, seeing that Andy had essentially split his force into two different lances for you Battletech fans out there, two different pushes, I decided that I wanted to defeat Andy's army in detail. I wanted to focus on the southern push first and then switch my firepower over to the northern thrust. Now, this was actually relatively easy for me to do. If you look at the terrain that's in the middle of the board, it's all obscuring but it's all got windows and knights don't benefit from obscuring terrain, which means I can just see straight through it. This means that I can move all my Russes down to the south, defeat the knights that are coming at me from that area and then just shoot straight across the map into his knights that are in the north. And so armed with this rough outline of a battle plan, I decided to get to it in my turn one. I moved all my Russes that were behind the big L-shaped ruin in my deployment zone down to the south that they could see right across the firing lane to the two big knights advancing upon me and my 30 infantry that were in the ruin near those big knights jumped out and got themselves into rapid fire and melter gun range and then it went over to my shooting phase and oh boy was it a display of imperial firepower my infantry just started laying on the las gun auto wounds laying on the plasma and the melter and he did get a little lucky with the saves here and there and he also did have a feel no pain on these knights because um they were mechanicus knights essentially and my big bullshit banner wasn't in range of my infantry to get past that feel no pain so my infantry did manage to take about half the wounds off one of these knights i then used my mortars which did have the big bullshit banner supporting them to take a few more wounds off it because again auto wounds plus even if i don't auto wound i'm wounding them on five so i can stack quite a few on there and it's only a three up save it's not that hard to sneak a few wounds past here and there and then I shot the Vanquisher and the Vanquisher, it started off the tournament strong. It fired a big old depleted uranium round, a big old Hesh round maybe, and it just went slamming through the cockpit of the Imperial Knight, got the hit, got the wound, no save allowed, and it did the big money shot. It got a six obviously on its damage plus D3, it got the three there so it did nine plus the mortal wounds, it got the big six there, 12 damage through, it just went <clears throat> and it decapitated the knight in one shot. It was a true titan killer, the Vanquisher cannon this turn. Not wanting to be outdone, the other tanks combined their firepower and between Gatekeeper, three Laz cannons, six heavy bolters and two overcharging executioner plasma cannons with them rerolls, with ingrained precision on the Gatekeeper tank, I was able to lay low the second big knight, the one with the laser cannon. This meant that in one turn, I had managed to destroy two out of three of the main threats to my army. And it was a really, really decisive blow. However, it was not all in my favor because Andy had a stratagem where if he spends two command points on a four plus, one of his knights gets back up. He obviously spent those two command points. He rolled the dice and he got a big fat one. Oh. It was a real shame and I really felt for Andy. I was actually rooting for him to get that knight back up because if he did, it would have made a real game. But unfortunately, by not getting it back up and also by him burning so many CP trying to get it back up, it really did mean that he was on the back foot going into round two. Honestly, I think that that stratagem should just cost three CP and the knight automatically gets up. It's a bit like in the guard codex where it's like it's two command points for fire on my target and it's still a four plus for that stratagem even to go off. If you've spent the command points, it should be going off. You shouldn't be having this random aspect to stratagem if you've already spent the command points. If it's free or it's a day sheet ability, sure, go for it, no problem. But being once per game, being two command points and then it being random, there's just too many barriers for that thing to ever actually go off. And so I don't think it's actually a very good stratagem. If it goes off, it's great. But if it doesn't, it basically really hamstrings you. And unfortunately, by not getting that second night up, the game was kind of sealed, guys. And it's never good to have a game which is already in your favour and then basically is over turn one. But yeah, that was it. Going into round two, Andy moved his remaining big knight further north, trying to 
get angles on me, but it couldn't really see anything. I think it killed an infantry squad. It didn't really matter. And then his baby knights piled a lot of firepower into one of my Lehman Russes, but unfortunately they weren't able to kill it. So then it swung back round to my turn two, and I'm basically operating an, the same army I had turn one, and that was able to kill two big knights. And I, in my turn two, just pick up three out of four of the baby knights. Both melter ones and, the, and one of the auto cannon ones. Uh, so I know both auto cannon ones and one of the melter ones. And that completely clears the southern flank. And it means that going into round three, Andy's got one big knight and one baby knight. Oh, and yeah, that big knight, I jumped out 30 infantry on it. I took half its wounds off it with 30 infantry just with take aim and auto wounding and yeah turn three andy is able to finish off a wounded tank which does get him an extra two little bring it down points but then in my turn three my remaining infantry are able to pick up his big knight that they'd already half damaged and then i'm able to kill his baby knight and beginning of round three Andy is completely tabled. And unfortunately, not only was it a bit of a battering on the tabletop, but it was an absolute thrashing in the final points, with the end score being 100 points to the Imperial Guard. Yep, we got the big 100, maxing everything out. And then the Knights got 29. 2 9. That's including painting score as well. It was an absolute mullering. Now, like I said at the beginning of the game, Imperial Knights into Guard, it's not a good matchup for the big stompy robot boys. But also, I would like to say that my list felt like it was doing what it was meant to do. I lost two Liam Russes. I lost a third of my firepower. I basically started this game with 16, 50 points, and I was still able to win the firefight and flatten the Knights within three turns. No matter how much infantry Andy killed, I was still able to pour more out onto the objectives. No matter how many tanks Andy killed, I still had more firepower than him. These basic core principles of the guard were really showing through, and they had demonstrated it very effectively in that first game. Game number one might have been relatively straightforward, but game number two was going to be a totally different story. For I was taking on the Adeptus Custodes. Now, I have a very, very mixed record against the Golden Banana Boys. Sometimes I'm just able to squeak a win out against them. Sometimes they go through my army like a hot knife through butter. They are definitely one of those factions that I have struggled against recently on the competitive scene. Now, I was playing against Luke, and I really liked his army list. A lot of Custodian players just engage Ogren Brain, and they just spam as many Wardens as possible. That is pretty effective, but it is kind of one-dimensional. And like any skew list, it is going to have a few limitations. But Andy had taken a big block of Wardens, so he had that solid core to his army. And then he'd taken another full squad of regular Custodian Guard. I actually quite liked this, and against me it was pretty effective. The regular Wardens can be picked off by las guns with Take Aim, that AP-1 really countering them. But the Custodian Guard with the Shields... Well, they just ignore that AP-1, so they're not a good matchup for me in any way, shape, or form. Now, supporting this really strong infantry core, Luke had two units of Custodes bikers. Each unit had three bikes in it, and every single bike was equipped with Melter missiles. Naturally, very good into my Lehman Russes. On top of this, there were a couple of small units of Terminators. One was a Lone Ranger, and the other squad had two Terminators in it. And there were also five basic Sisters of Silence, just sat there on the backfield objective. And of course, the whole force was led by the one, the only... Trajan Valoris, big dick daddy himself, was leading these custodies today. Now, the mission for game two was data scry salvage, and for secondaries, I took boots on the ground, inflexible command, and retrieve battlefield data. The go-to objectives for the guard right now, and the ones that I, of course, built my list around with those engineers. Luke went for the Auric Mortalis, which is where he picks one of my units, and if he kills it, 
he basically gets 15 points and he had to pick the most expensive unit which in this army actually was my vanquisher lehman russ because it's 165 points for the russ with the sponsons and then it's 20 25 points for the tank case on top of that which actually makes it the most expensive one he then took engage on all fronts because he's got the bike and he's got the terminator to do that relatively easily and he also took no prisoners now that last one was a really smart move by luke and a mistake that a lot of people play when they face a list is they see the lehman russes and they go you know what i'm gonna go for bring it down but lehman russes are really tough and it's actually pretty difficult to kill all the lean russes to get the big 12 points on bring it down so going for no prisoners is very smart because luke knows that i'm gonna have to use my infantry to screen him out to stop him from getting to the tanks and so if he's killing infantry anyway he might as well earn points for doing so now in terms of deployment luke puts his terminators in the sky i put my engineers underground and then we get to the proper deployment now my deployment is actually fairly straightforward very similar to last time, I deployed my infantry behind ruins near the front and I have my tanks as far back as possible with my mortars just occupying the first and second floor of the big L-shaped ruin in my deployment zone. Now, Luke deployed his wardens on one flank and his custodian guard on another flank and then he basically had his sister silence holding his back for the objective and he had a unit of bikes that were going down each flank as well. This essentially split his army into two thrusts and I'm not sure if that was the right thing. Custodies have fantastic force concentration and yes this was a six objective mission so the custodies were going to have to spread out a little bit to score the primary but I feel they are best used when they concentrate into one big death ball of doom. And by spreading out a little bit, I feel like Luke never quite had enough to break through in one area. And I could screen him out relatively efficiently with the infantry that I had available to me. But moving on to the game itself, we go into turn one. And again, I lose the roll-off. I'm not too bothered about losing the roll-off in this game. I actually didn't want to go first. If I go first in this situation, I have nothing to see or shoot. And all I really do is advance forward and give Luke an early turn one charge. So I was actually okay with going second in this scenario. Now, Luke basically moves his infantry forward, but manages to keep them out of line of sight. And the two units of bikes come screaming straight down the middle, just zoom, zoom, zoom. I think Luke used a redeploy so he could get a bit more force concentration on them. And he just zooms them so that they can both see one of my Lehman Russes, which is exposed. I couldn't quite hide every single Russ from him. Now, all these Mel's missiles go piling into the Lehman Russ and they manage to destroy it. I decide to use Vengeful Salute on that Lehman Russ because I figured, why not? It might as well do something on the way out. And it actually does pretty well. It managed to get a decent number of shots and I think it ends up doing three or four wounds to one of these bike squads. And then Luke proceeds to make every single four up save. And this was an ominous foreshadowing for what was going to happen in this game you see it then comes over to my turn one and i'm like right i need to kill those custodians bikers once they're gone luke's army is pretty slow just foot slogging around the place and i can actually outmaneuver it in many cases my tanks are faster than his infantry and i can always move move my infantry out of the way or to screen and move block him right so I decide, you know what, I'm going to push forward my infantry, I'm going to make a screen because I know the wardens are coming in, I know the custodies guard are coming in, so I'm going to make the first screen with about 30, 40 infantry, and then all of my remaining Lehman Russes, five Lehman Russes, and a whole bunch of infantry and the mortars are just going to put everything they can into those custodies bikers. And I feel like I've got enough firepower to easily wipe them out. In fact, I actually line up a few of my Russes in kind of cheeky positions so that I know that if I manage to finish off the bikers, I can probably get a few sneaky shots going into his custodian guard, which are trying to spread out across two objectives. So I'm like, you know what, this is this is not possible, this is not too bad. I could probably kill the bikers and start working on the infantry all in my first turn. I proceed into the shooting phase. I proceed to roll a respectable number of shots at all of my Lehman Russes. No standouts, there were no big nine shots, but there were no terrible four shots. All the Lehman Russes doing what they should be doing. Rolling, you know, three or four shots on their battle cannons, getting the plus three, getting an average of six, seven shots from each one of my tanks. All going well. And each tank proceeds to start putting rounds down into the bikers. 
and Luke continues to roll four plus saves. In fact, it actually comes down to the very last Lasgun bolt to bring down these Custodes bikers. Now, I do manage to wipe both squads out. But honestly, it was a really close run thing. And I thought for a moment there that I was not going to be able to wipe the bikers out. And if that had happened, I would be in deep doggy doo-doo. Because I had moved my units out on the assumption that the bikers would be dead. And therefore, fly wasn't going to be a thing. And therefore, I could kind of have my rushes a little bit further forward. So that it doesn't matter because the infantry will die in front of them. But the tanks will be safe. If those bikes had lived, I would have lost the game. Right there, right then. The bikes would have come flying in, tying up my vehicles, and it would have just been just game over turn one. But it did take all of my firepower. I mean, when you see three Lehman Russes pile into a Custodes biker squad, and you've only killed one and a half of them, that's when you start to sweat. When you see a bunch of infantry go into, when you see 20 infantry unload into a wounded Custodes biker who's got one wound left, and it literally comes down to the very last save, you know it's been a close run thing. But fortunately, just through pure, unrelenting, pig-headed, brutal firepower, I was able to kill my targets. And I did achieve my minimum goal for that turn, which was kill the bikers. I thought I would have been able to work on the custodian's infantry as well. But as it was going into turn two, I have two full blocks of Custodes Infantry in my face, turn two, ready to deliver the pain train. And that is exactly what they do. In the south, the Wardens come swinging in with those beautiful axes of theirs, and they just chop to pieces a squad of infantry. At the same time, they blast away a unit of infantry behind, actually deleting a couple of layers of my infantry screen, which was pretty effective. And the Custodes Infantry the north do exactly the same thing. They continue spreading out across two objectives. Remember, they're all double obsec, so... If he's got basically five guys on each objective, it makes it very difficult for me to just sneak a single infantry squad on there and take it off him. And Trajan's up there supporting them in the north. And also, he brings in his Terminators. Now, he is forced to bring in one of his Terminator squads on the backfield objective. Because I actually had fired my mortars into the Sister Silence in the end. They were the last thing to shoot and I didn't need to use them into the bikers. Um, and so by firing them into the Sister Silence, I was able to kill uh, all but two of them. And that meant that my opponent was forced to redirect a Terminator onto that backfield objective because if he didn't, I was going to mortar those Sister Silence again and my opponent loses his backfield, his home base uh, objective. Apologies if I misspoke about that in the first turn. I thought I'd fired them into the bikers, but remembering now, I had actually fired them into the Sisters of Silence. That was actually pretty big because it meant it was one less Terminator that I had to deal with. The other two Terminators come plopping down and they go for uh, the southern flank near to where the Wardens are. He goes for a long bomb charge on some of my infantry that were screening down there, but unfortunately he doesn't get it off. It then comes round to my turn two, and I know that this is make or break. If Luke continues to roll four up saves like an absolute fiend, this game is over. Because I cannot hold those Wardens off for another turn. He will just chew through all of my infantry. And he'll start tagging up all of my tanks. This is do or die. And so I bring forward all of my Lehman Russes to get an angle on these Wardens. And I bring forward all of my infantry. In fact... I kind of do a Billy Big Bollocks maneuver here and I bring my mortars out of the ruin because I think to myself, there is no point in me shooting these mortars in direct fire into these wardens. They're just going to have a two up save. But if I move the mortars down and out, I can shoot directly into the wardens who are right in my face. And thanks to the big bullshit banner of doom, I won't suffer the mass one to hit penalty from moving and shooting with heavy weapons because I can ignore the hit modifiers. And thanks to take aim, I'll actually be AP minus one. And thanks to being strength five, anything that doesn't auto wound will actually still be wounding on four. So mortars firing directly are actually pretty decent custodies weapons. And he's not going to get feel no pain because of the big bullshit banner. So what I end up doing is just piling. To start off, I just pile all of my infantry into these wardens. And I don't know what happened. Maybe Luke's dice were part of some kind of dice union and the union boss came down and was like all right lads you've rolled all your four up saves for this game you fulfilled your quota make sure you don't roll anymore 
because Luke Dice went from being the hottest thing I have ever seen, the hottest thing since the surface of the fucking sun, to being colder than the Antarctic. My boy couldn't roll a save to save his life. I mean, I'm not even just talking four up saves, I'm talking three up saves. Just nothing went his way, turn two. And the wardens just completely evaporated. So much so, I didn't even need to use my mortars on them. So all of my just light infantry, plus a little bit of fire support from my tanks, just picks up the wardens in short order. I then fire the mortars indirectly anyway. Ironically, I moved the position where they didn't need to, but then ended up firing them indirectly anyway. And they go after the Sister Silence and the Terminator holding the backfield objective. One squad of mortars just picks up the two sisters, and the other two squads of mortars just blow away that Terminator. So now Luke's not holding his home field objective. The two Terminators that had tried to get the long bomb charge turn two were just left out in the open with their dicks in the wind. So naturally I fired a single melter gun and a plasma gun at them and killed both. Because again, Luke couldn't make any saves this turn. And then my remaining firepower just piled into the custodian guard up north who finally started to bring things back a little bit but they took an absolute beating and still i think three or four of them went down i have never seen a game flip on its head so quickly going into turn two luke was in complete control i was hemmed into a corner he had all the cards in his hand it just so happened to turn out that i had an uno reverse card up my sleeve and i just slapped that thing down and going into turn three luke had eight models left on the board seven custodian guard and trajan and maybe in the fluff, that would be enough to conquer a whole planet. But on the tabletop, that basically meant it was game. To put salt in the wound, I'd kind of put those remaining models in a really shitty position anyway. Because they were strung out across two objectives. And if Luke wanted to move off those objectives to come and kill me, all he was going to kill was a bunch of infantry that had been set up to screen him. And he wouldn't be getting any more primary points. So in Luke's turn three, he does decide to go for the kill, try and do as much damage as he can. And then my turn three, I just pick up every remaining model in the board. And that is it. Once again, end of turn three, I have tabled another opponent. And unfortunately for my opponent, once again, the final score was pretty bleak. I maxed out my points at 97. I couldn't quite get the big 100 because I'd taken retrieved data. And Luke came away with 31 victory points. 3-1. And yes, once again, that is including painting score. It was a pretty big thrashing. Now, it could be easy to look at this game and say it all came down to luck, but I think if you scratch below the surface, you'll see that that's not entirely the case. Overall, the luck balanced out. My luck was pretty average throughout the whole game, and Luke got it in all one turn and then not much in the second turn. But overall, he probably made the number of saves that he should have made overall on average. I think what this really showed was the strength of redundancy in the guard list, because we weren't bringing any fancy combos we weren't having to spend loads of points on special characters i just had lots of infantry and i had lots of tanks it didn't matter that i lost the leaving us turn one i still had a lot of firepower left over it didn't matter that i lost more than half my infantry in the first couple of turns of the game if i only had 60 infantry if i'd lost 40 or 50 of them turns one and two i would be screwed but because I had 90 infantry, 100 if you include the engineers, 118 if you include the mortars, it meant that even when I lost about half of it, I still had more than enough to throw up another screen and I still had plenty of units that could really take advantage of the big bullshit banner. And the big bullshit banner is probably what won it for me this game. Being able to ignore those feel no pains on the wardens meant that they fell over very quickly when my infantry were able to do their thing. But now we move on to game number three, the final game of day one. And I was going to have the biggest challenge of the event so far. I was facing off against Jack and his combined Admech and Votan force. Now, some of you might hear that and think that's kind of crazy. But in my opinion, it's actually genius. Yes, you do miss out on the canticles for the Admech. And yes, you do miss out on the grudge tokens for the Votan but you don't necessarily need them. Both of these armies complement each other very well. You see, the Votan 
bring the firepower. And whether they've got good tokens or not, Vodan firepower is very, very good. And then the Admech bring cheap, durable infantry for the Votan, something that they lack, because Votan armies are very elite, they're almost as elite as Custodes armies. But by being able to add these two things together, you've actually got one side of the equation which is giving you the volume of bodies that you need, and you've got the other side of the equation that is bringing the durability and firepower to make this a very effective force. And if you don't believe me, Jack had absolutely smashed his first two opponents, completely crushed them as well as I had. That's why we'd ended up getting paired against each other. And this game was the most difficult one I had of day number three. And I saw this list and straight away I thought, there's going to be some method to this madness. This kid's not just smashed two random things together. He's actually put some quite clever thought into this. So taking you through what Jack had specifically, he had a Skatari Marshal, a regular Tech Priest Dominus and then a Tech Priest Manipulus. This was so he could hand out all of the buffs that he needed to his army. And then he had about 40 Skatari infantry in various 5 and 10 man squads. And then he had a squad of 10 Hearthkin. He needed those for his Votan patrol. And then he had four of the Chicken Walkers for the Admech with the Auto Cannons. These things put out a lot of DACA. In fact, each one of these Chicken Walkers puts out the same amount of auto cannon shots as a Lehman Rust Exterminator. I was kind of jealous of them, I'm not going to lie. There was also some specialist infantry as well. So the Admech brought a unit of six Rustalkers and the Votan brought a unit of five Berserkers. Overall, I really liked this force composition. You had the Chicken Walkers providing cheap, long-range fire support, lots of DACA. You then had the Skatari and the Harkin providing the bodies, and they're all Lucius, and they can all be buffed up by various means, so they're pretty durable. So there's a, there's a lot of bodies there. There's about 50, 60 bodies there. And then you've got the Berserkers and the Rustalkers bringing just that little bit of combat punch. You don't need too much combat punch. Your guns are the main focus, but it's nice to have a couple of units in your force that can do the counterattacking, and that's exactly what these things were designed to do but tying the whole thing together really the big threat in the army was the two i'll say again two hecaton land fortresses and they were armed to the girls with all of the beams you could possibly stuff on them these two units by far were the things that I were most concerned about. They bring so much to the table. I have difficulty blowing away one Hecaton, even with my Imperial Guard firepower list. So taking on two, it did not look good for me. Also, bear in mind, these things are really durable thanks to their regimental doctrine. They've got a four plus invulnerable save. And there's a Broke Forge Master who is supporting them, meaning that anytime that I do get a shot through, there's a chance that He's just going to turn that damage to zero. So the Vanquisher is not going to have a good time this game. So that was Jack's list. But now let's move on to the mission and secondaries. So the mission was Conversion, which is a five objective mission. And for secondaries, I took the standard suite, Boots on the Ground, Inflexible Command and Retrieve Battlefield Data. Jack went for Eradication of the Flesh, Hidden Archeo Vault and Retrieve Battlefield Data. In case you don't know, Eradication of the Flesh and Hidden Archeo Vault are two Admech ones. And they're a bit strange, but I actually really like them. So Hidden Archeo Vault is where your opponent picks one objective in No Man's Land. And if the Admech player controls at the end of the turn, they gain five points. Now, my instinct here was to pick one of the flank objectives. But I realized that there was a chance that... Jack would be able to hold those objectives whilst remaining out of line of sight. So I actually picked the one that's bang in the center. That might seem kind of crazy, but it was the one that was completely exposed and it was easy for me to get multiple fire angles on it. If he jumps on that objective, anything that goes onto it is going to die. So it was kind of like, yeah, sure, you can have the objective that's nearest to you, but if you go on it, it's going to cost you. Also meant that I had a lot of units that were near that objective as well, so it meant that I could potentially contest it or stop him from getting it for a few turns. Eradication of the flesh is kind of complicated to explain, but basically, if the Admech kill more of your units with their vehicles, then you destroy of the Admech vehicles, they get points for it. So as long as they're wiping stuff out and not losing vehicles in return, they're getting points for it. Now, due to the terrain on this map, 
deployment actually was very interesting and I had to put quite a lot of thought into it. Because of the way that the ruins were situated in the middle, if I just shoved all my tanks at the back, there was a real chance that they wouldn't be able to get any fire angles for quite a lot of the game. And if they did, they wouldn't be great ones. So I actually had to deploy my tanks relatively far forward, well, much further forward than I'd normally like to. I then also had to be very careful with where my infantry were going because anything that is exposed, I'm going to lose. Remember, I'm not playing against knights, I'm not playing against crows, I'm not playing against an army which I easily outshoot. This is Admech and Votan, two forces which can match guard pound for pound in the firepower department. But overall, I do manage to hide my tanks, even if a couple of them are a bit further forward and a bit riskier than I like. When it comes to my infantry, I did deploy 30 behind each ruin, which is pretty standard, but I did have a bit of a game plan for each of these squads. The infantry that were in the most bottom ruin, their job was basically to move, move, move every turn onto the next piece of landslide blocking terrain and just hold the objective. That was their one job, just to create waves of infantry that could just push onto that objective. And they should be pretty safe there. I then take the 30 infantry in the middle and they've got one job. They just need to mess around on the middle objective and just make hidden archivolt as difficult as possible for my opponent. The infantry that are on my left flank and towards the, the top of my deployment zone, their job is to move on to that other objective that's sort of towards the top left. Problem is that even with move and move, I can't move them far enough so that they get out of line of sight. So it's kind of a death sentence. The plan really is to use those infantry to deny my opponent that objective if and when he moves onto it. So once both players are deployed, it's time to find out who goes first. And I actually win the dice roll this time, which I'm not too bothered about. I mean, it's okay, but I would rather my opponent win the dice roll to see if he massively pushes forward and exposes himself. As it is, I get the first turn. Now, I can't see any of my opponent's army. So pushing forward with any tanks or infantry, basically a waste of time. So my first turn is really, really cagey. I retrieve some data in my backfield. I push a squad of infantry out onto that top objective just to try and bait Jack out. And then I move, move, move another squad of infantry that's in the south over into the next line of blocking piece of terrain so I can hold that bottom objective. I'm pretty confident that that means I'm going to hold two because I hold my home one and I'll hold that one in the bottom right. There's not much Jack can do. He hasn't got any indirect fire and his infantry isn't going to be able to get over there and take it off me the first turn. So that's all right. I've got two objectives in the bank for primary going forward. The big thing, turn one, is I take 10 of my infantry from the center and I tell them to move and move. But I don't go the auto advance six inches. I just take the two extra inches of normal movement. I then move them as far as I can and I then charge some of Jack's infantry that he had front-lined because he'd put a unit of five Skatari on that fr on the front of his deployment zone so that at the end of his turn one he could just jump them onto the objective and get hit in archivolt. I charge them and both sides basically do no damage to each other in combat because it's Skatari versus guardsmen no one's got any combat buffs up so both sides just slap fight each other but it doesn't matter I don't need to win the fight. I just need to stop those Skatari from moving on to the middle objective turn one and getting Archeobot, which I do completely. There's no way he can fall back and get around my infantry, which are basically encircling him. So that was a quite a clever move by me, and I do manage to deny him Archeobot because every turn that I can stop him from doing that, if I can get to turn three and he's not got it, it basically means he can't max that out. And I've got 20 more infantry that can do exactly the same thing in the following turns. The only shooting I have in my first turn is the mortars and they just bombard everything into the berserkers. I want to get rid of those as quickly as possible because I can get into a firefight with the Skatari. I'm fairly comfortable with doing that and with the Hearthkin. But those berserkers, given a chance, they are going to tear through any of my infantry that are hiding out of line of sight. So I just blow them off the table turn one. And that's my first turn. I tie up some Skatari, I move on to some objectives and I blow away the Berserkers. I've given my opponent basically nothing of value to see. Now, a less skilled player than Jack would have seen my caginess and got frustrated and gone, you know what, I'm going to charge at you. If you're going to be a coward, I'm going to be super aggressive. But Jack did not do that. He played it very smartly and he also played it cagey. 
He moved his chicken walkers forward and he was able to get a decent fire angle on my infantry squad that had moved up to try and take that northern objective and he just blew them away. I should say I actually did move a Lehman Russ up there as well to try and bait the land fortresses out, but he didn't go for it. In fact, Jack was basically doing the same thing as me. He was setting up his units so that they could be in position to jump out and counterattack me if and when I exposed myself. So both players were playing it very cagey. And to be honest, this is kind of how the game progressed for the first two or three turns. I was moving infantry onto objectives. I was blocking any sort of way for him to get onto the middle objective for Archeo Vault. I was using my mortar targeting very carefully. Anytime any Skutari started getting close to the middle of the board, I would just dump nine mortars into them. I'd put ingrained precision on one of those mortar squads to make sure I was getting as many shots as possible. And so I was really, for the first three turns, just using my ability to have indirect fire to whittle away at Jack's infantry and using my ability to have sacrificial waves to deny him his primary and secondary points. Because every time a unit got close to the center of the board, I would just move, move, move one of my center squads out like I had turn one and I'd wrap and trap them. Because our infantry were both terrible in combat, it meant all I needed to do was hold them in place, right? And then on the bottom flank, where the objective is on my right hand side, Every time Jack moved some Skutari or some Hearthkin down that way, what would happen is I would launch a unit of infantry out from behind the line of sight blocking terrain that's on the objective, and I would shoot and charge him and time up again. And then the other bit of line of sight blocking terrain that's in my deployment zone, where I've still got plenty of infantry hiding behind that, the one that you can see right now that's in the sort of bottom right of this picture, I would take those 10 infantry and I would move and move them and they would take the place of the squad that's just vacated the line of sight blocking terrain on the objective and they would hold it. So I was always holding objectives whilst denying Jack the ability to get his points. And so for the first three turns, it was very much an infantry war with me having the slight advantage in numbers and fire support because of the indirect fire from the mortars. But turn four is where things really kicked off because it gets to turn four and I'm feeling quite confident. I have been able to score more primary than Jack every single turn. My inflexible command has been ticking up nicely and boots on the ground has been Great as well, I've been able to get two or three points on that every single turn. Retrieve battlefield data, I've managed to get it off three times at this point, and I know I'm not going to get it going into Jack's deployment zone because my engineers have already popped up at this point, and there's no way I'm going to be able to move some infantry over there. So my secondaries are just ticking along very nicely, but Jack's secondaries, he's not got Archeo Vault in the first three turns. So I'm like, okay, I know he can't max that one out now. And Retrieve Battlefield Data, he's going to have the same points as me on that one. He's only going to be able to get it off three times. He's only going to get the eight points. So one of my boots on the ground is basically going to equal or beat his Hidden Archeo Vault if he gets it the last two turns. And Retrieve Battlefield Data, we're equal on. So it's kind of, it's kind of going to come down to Eradication of the Flesh versus Inflexible Command. And I know I'm going to get maxed out Inflexible Command. Like, it's impossible not to do that as a guard player. So going into turn four, I'm like, I need to stop Jack from basically getting any more eradication points. And he had made a, in my opinion, key mistake in his turn three. I feel like he'd finally got frustrated with the cage off or he'd finally realized that it was in my favor. And if things kept going this way, it was just going to be five turns of him scoring all right, but not quite getting the points that he needs to win the game. So he went for a big push in his turn three with his chicken walkers, and he used them to pick up a couple of squads of my infantry. The problem was that those chicken walkers were the only thing scoring him eradication of the flesh. And going into turn four, I was like, well, I know I'm doing fine on my points. I know that it's going to come down to this final secondary and I don't mind if I lose all my Lehman Russ at this point. They're not worth any points to me. So I actually go all in, turn four. And on my turn four, I bring all my Russes out. I bring loads of my infantry out and I go for a big push. I basically wipe out the remainder of Jack's infantry, you know, in an infantry duel with the mortar support. And then my Lehman Russes 
pile loads of firepower into his chicken walkers and I managed to kill every single one of them. The flat damage three from those battle cannons was really, really important. Gatekeeper and another battle cannon, Russ, really did the business. But then it exposed me to return firepower turn four from Jack. But it didn't really matter at that point because I don't mind if I lose Russes. They're not really doing anything for me. They've done their job of destroy the chicken walkers. So the Hecatons finally come out. They blast away a couple of Lehman Russes. And then in my turn five, I'm like, you know what? I wonder if four Russes can kill the Hecatons. I pile four Russes into one Hecaton land fortress. Guys, I didn't even get close to killing it. Four percent vulnerable save. Even the, the Vanquisher managed to get a shot through and it wasn't blanked by the Broker because he'd had to use it against the Laz Cannon. But the Vanquisher was able to take off quite a few wounds, but everything else just bounced. And when the Broker Forge Master went over there and repaired it, I don't think I even managed to take half its wounds off. So those things were really, really durable, and it really vindicated my tactic of just not engaging them. I basically killed everything around the land fortresses and just left them to their own devices. So it got to the end of the game, and I actually had managed to score pretty well. I'd got plenty of primary points. I'd got um, 44 primary points by the end because I'd also been doing the corrupted ground secondary part of the primary as well. And then boots on the ground, I managed to get 11 out of 15, which is pretty good. Uh, and in flexible command, I maxed out. And naturally, I did okay on retrieve battlefield data, getting the eight points there. My final score was actually 88 points. And Jack's final score was 68. So not a smashing by any means in fact the thing that really let jack down was his primary score the fact that he basically only got four points a turn for turns two turns three turns four and he did manage to get the big 12 because he went second on turn five but uh, i'd also managed to get 12 at one point as well so basically it was that primary score that let him down in terms of secondaries his hidden archeo vault he ended up getting 10 points in that which is kind of equal to my boots on the ground his retrieve battlefield data was equal to mine like i thought it would be and eradication of the flesh he only managed to get about um eight points on that because he wasn't quite able to do it i think turn one and then or turn three it's one turn we hadn't quite managed to do it and then turns four almost turns four or five he couldn't get it because the chicken walkers were dead so it ended up being a comfortable victory for the guard but like I said at the beginning of this battle, it definitely wasn't a smashing in any way, shape or form. And both sides still had a reasonable amount of force left over. I think by the time the game finished, I still had about 20 or 30 infantry and a couple of Russes left. And Jack still had both Hecatons and his Admet characters. So both sides had managed to do a lot of damage to each other. But honestly, I know exactly what won me that game. It was having more infantry than my opponent and it was having indirect fire. Interestingly, my Lehman Russes didn't do a huge amount actively this game, but passively they were invaluable. Because my opponent was so worried about the firepower that six Russes could bring to bear, he was very cagey with his Hecaton land fortresses. With the benefit of hindsight, I think those things win that fight. They're so durable with toughness eight and a four plus save and void armor and the ability to reduce one of my shots to zero damage. I think even if he rolls out, and then I get the drop on him with six Russes. I think he survives that. I mean, he did survive it. And then he starts just blowing up two Russes a turn every turn. And my ability to defeat those land fortresses just goes down exponentially. So that was the end of game number three and the end of the first day. And I had achieved a new personal best. I had gone undefeated on one day of a tournament. I always normally throw away game number two or game number three, but I'd actually managed to get three wins. And that last one was a proper legitimate win. It wasn't a complete smashing. It was a close fought game with both players bringing all of their tactics to bear. So I was actually feeling really confident. And it also took a lot of pressure off going into day two because I was like, no matter what happens now, I've got a positive win-loss ratio. Even if I throw the next two games or just lose them, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be able to walk away with my head held high. But now let's move on to day number two and game number four. The penultimate battle in our epic journey. And I was to face my greatest challenge yet. It was going to be Greg and his full-blown Leagues of Votan army. Now, I'm not going to lie to you boys. Going into this game, I was not feeling 100% confident 
of my victory. In fact, you could say I was feeling downright nervous. And there were a number of reasons for this. Firstly, after winning three games in a row on day one, I was now occupying some of the top tables and the calibre of player I was rubbing shoulder with was pretty high. In fact, I would say I felt like a little bit of an imposter. I looked around and I saw people with meta demons and Votan and Dark Angels and I'm there with this Johnny Rambo guard list. And speaking of good players and good lists, Greg was no exception. In fact, I knew Greg from his reputation. Often I have seen this guy go 5-0 and at tournaments and he regularly does extremely well on the competitive scene. He also often runs pretty good lists as well and this was no exception. In fact, his Votan list consisted of a Hecaton Land Fortress, just the one, but it of course was supported by the Brokeer Forge Master, which had the ability to reduce one of my incoming attacks to zero damage. Standard affair. He also had some Berserkers, a couple of squads of them, and a couple of Sagittarius for the Berserkers to go in. And then he had what I believe to be the main threat of his list. He had three squads of the Pioneer Bikers, two squads of three, one squad of four, and he also had two big squads of the Exosuit Dwarves. Now, these two units are a big problem for me because they essentially hard counter the majority of my army. You see, the bikers are very fast. They have a pre-game move and then they can move again and then, of course, they can fly. And they also put out a horrendous amount of anti-infantry firepower. This meant that these three units of bikes, given the opportunity to go first, could clear up pretty much all my infantry in one go. I have played against Pioneer Bikers many times, Master Dwarf, and I can tell you that they happily pick up a couple of squads in the shooting phase, and then they charge into another squad, and they have enough attacks to be able to make it combat ineffective. They might not completely wipe it out, but you're going to lose four or five guardsmen and just be reduced down to a bit of a fragmented squad. On top of this, they are obsec. So the fact that they shred my infantry and remove my obsec very quickly, whilst at the same time being the main source of obsec for my opponent, really does create a very effective one-two punch and allows Greg to, at any point, just hop onto the objective, clear me off it and claim it for himself. As for the exosuit dwarves, there was a squad of these armed with the grav cannons and another squad armed with beams. Both of these guns are very effective at destroying my tanks. And the fact that he had two squads of them, and they were both pretty chonky squads as well, five dwarves in each one, I believe, meant that he had the firepower between these two and the Hecaton Land Fortress to just be able to blow my tanks back to Kingdom Come. The worst thing about these guys as well is I believe that the Broker Forge Master can actually use his blank ability just to make one of my attacks zero damage on the exosuits as well. So even if I'm firing battle cannons and stuff into them, they just go, nope. I'm not going to let that one through. And the fact they've got a fantastic armor save combined with void arm, it means that they're incredibly durable and they're honestly more than happy to get into a straight up firefight with me. I mean, this is the Votan, man. If there's one faction that likes shooting stuff, it's these guys. But it matters not. We have played against good players before. We have played against good lists before. And all of them have been laid low by the hammer of the emperor. Unfortunately... It didn't end there and shit continued to go sideways because not only was I playing off against someone who I personally believe was more skilled than I with a list that hard countered mine, but we were also playing on a mission with a subsequent deployment that completely and utterly favoured my opponent. You see, the mission for game number four was Tide of Conviction. This is where both players deploy on their long table edge. If you're an old school player like me, it's known as Dawn of War deployment. It's also, weirdly, a six objective mission, meaning that you have to hold two of them in order to get any primary points. Now, the big problem with this mission is that the no man's land is very, very small and there is no rule saying that you can't use pre-game moves. On other missions that use this kind of deployment, GW's gone, yeah, probably don't want people getting a turn one charge, so we'll make a rule where you can't use pre-game moves and you can't go into no man's land and all that kind of good stuff. But nope, tired of conviction, it's you want to get a turn one charge, you go for it. And that was going to be massive because of those Pioneer Bikers. 
because they're able to zip across the board if my opponent gets turn one. And if I don't have a big infantry screen up, they are just going to tie all of my vehicles up and I might not get to fire them for a turn or two. But that also means that if I want to counter that tactic, I have to expose a lot of my infantry and I have to give up my obsec advantage. And it just puts me at a really big disadvantage because either I have to accept the fact that my tanks are going to get tied up or I have to accept the fact that I'm going to lose my objective secured advantage. One way or another, if my opponent gets first turn, it's a really big advantage for him. But wait, there's more. Because going first is no advantage to me either. Because I am playing against an elite army that can hide all of its units behind line of sight blocking terrain. Which means if I get first, my turn is basically a waste of time. Yes, I've stopped my opponent from doing a pioneer alpha strike on me. But I won't be able to see anything. So I won't be able to shoot anything. And my opponent's not just going to deploy units on the line. He doesn't have to because... I don't have anything that can zip across the board and alpha strike him. But he has that advantage against me. So it's just a terrible matchup. Either I go first and I don't get to do anything my turn one. Or I go second and I have to lose all of my infantry. Because the Votan just have that firepower to zoom out and just do all that damage. And then the Hecatons can come out, the Sadducers can come out and he can just... Absolutely. It's a Votan firing line. If I expose 50, 60, 70 infantry to make an unbroken infantry line to try and screen my tanks, he just picks up every model that I have out there. Remember, this is Votan v Guard. Whatever anyone exposes is going to get blown off the table. So my opponent just has, it doesn't matter what I do, he just has the advantage. In fact, guys, let me just level with you for a moment and really put this into perspective. In 20 years of playing Warhammer 40k, half of those being in competitive games, I have never seen a matchup that was so uneven. At every level, the odds were stacked against one player. But moving on, Morden will stop being a salty sailor now. Let's take a look at the secondaries that both players went for. I went for the standard suite of boots on the ground, inflexible command and retrieve battlefield data. They'd done me good so far and I was confident they would do me good once again. Greg went for lay claim, grind them down and raise the banners high. Now grind them down is a standard one from the core rulebook. Kill more units than you lose, get three victory points, raise the banners high. You guys all know what that does. Lay claim is a Votan one though and it's actually really interesting. What you do is your opponent gives you three more objective markers and you as the player opposing the Votan get to place them anywhere in no man's land. Now at the end of the game for each one of those objectives that your opponent controls they score five victory points. Now for deployment I actually mixed things up. So starting off, I deployed a lot of my infantry on the line. About half of it was exposed to enemy firepower. And I needed to do this in order to stop those pioneer bikers that I've talked about already. I then was able to hide uh, four of my Russes in the terrain. But it was actually quite light. And I couldn't quite fit them all behind landscape block and terrain. And I was worried about that land fortress coming out and picking one of them off. So what they ended up doing is putting... Four of my vehicles on the board. I had two of them in the big ruin and then I had one behind each small ruin. And then I put two of my Lehman Russes, the squadron of El Clasicos, in strategic reserve. Because so I figured they're not going to be able to do much turn one anyway, so they might as well come in turn two. As for Greg, well what he ended up doing is putting a unit of Pioneer Bikers behind each one of the ruins in his deployment zone. And then on each flank, he put a Sagittar with a unit of Berserkers in it. And then in the centre, he had his Hecaton Land Fortress with Carl, with Brokeer Forge Master. So he kind of broke his force down into these really cool three mini armies, which is something that I also like to do with my 40k forces. But once both players had deployed all their armies, it was time for that all-important roll-off. Who was going to get first turn? And huzzah! I actually managed to win the roll-off, which meant I wasn't going to get smashed by those pioneer bikers. Unfortunately, looking back on it now with the benefit of hindsight, going second was no better. And in fact, I can conclusively say that by winning that roll-off, I actually lost the game before we even got to turn one.
Now, this might sound completely bonkers and a massive over-exaggeration, but let me explain. You see, this is tides of conviction. You have to hold two objectives to get any primary points. And because of the terrain in this mission, like I said, it's quite light, it's easy to hold two. You've got one in your deployment zone behind a ruin. You've got one to the left that's behind a ruin. You can hold those two, but trying to hold that third one is almost impossible. And that's true for both players over the course of the game because that third one is stuck out and it's completely exposed. And that means that anything you put out on that objective is going to die, making it really, really difficult to lock down and hold from one turn to the next, meaning you're unlikely to get those extra primary points in your command phase, unless you go second. Because when you go second, turn five, you score at the end of your turn, not at the beginning. This means that the player that went first in their turn four has to push as much as possible out onto those three objectives in order to try and survive their opponent's turn four, hoping that some of their units live so they were able to get some primary points going into turn five. But we're playing guard versus Votan. Anything that gets put out there just gets deleted. And so that's basically what happened in my turn four. Over the course of the first few turns, I had scored a reasonable amount of primary. In fact, I was ahead on primary over Greg over the first four turns of the game. But on my turn four, I go for the big push. We both played it pretty cagey up until this point. So somehow I'm able to get about 40, 50 infantry out onto all the objectives. And I'm also able to push about four of my Lehman Russes onto them as well. This gives me a good amount of objectives secured. I even put OBSEC on my vehicle so that Greg can't just steal it off me with a random Berserker or Sagittar. But then Greg gets his turn four because he went second. And he proceeds to just delete my whole army. It's Votan, of course he's going to. I've had, th those those primary objectives are quite far forward and it's dawn of all deployment. So it's really not hard for him just to nip out and get a charge on me. So he ends up deleting pretty much my entire army in his turn four. It comes over to my turn five. I don't get any primary. Greg has taken me off two out of three objectives because I have to hold two objectives to get any primary. That means I get zero primary. But because Greg goes second, when it goes over to his turn five, he's able to get 12 victory points. Because it's easy enough for him at the end of the game to just sit on three prime objectives. Easy peasy. And think about that. Normally when you play a mission, the player that goes second gets 12 victory points on their final primary round. But the player that went first still manages to get four, or in most cases, they get eight points, right? So it creates a extra four point bonus for the player that went second. But in Tides of Conviction, it creates a 12 point bonus for that person that went second. But it gets even worse, guys, because there's actually an even bigger advantage to go second on this which is the tertiary part of the mission, the second part of the primary. Now for Tides of Conviction, this is overrun. Now over the first four turns, five turns of the game, you score two victory points if you're able to hold an objective in your opponent's territory. Now that was actually relatively easy for me to do. I could chuck out an infantry squad or something similar onto one of Greg's objectives every turn, and that would allow me to get two points. Great, in fact, once again, over the course of the first four or five turns, I actually got more overrun points than Greg did. But there's a second part of that tertiary objective, which is at the end of the game, for each enemy objective that you hold, you get three bonus victory points. Which meant that Greg, because he's got his pioneer bikers and because he can move really quickly, he can do the acceleration stratagem as well. He is able to after blowing my table, uh, my, blow my army off the table turn four, he is able to zip onto all of my objectives, scoring him an additional nine victory points. Again, those are nine victory points you do not have access to, basically, if you went first. So it's not even a 12-point swing. It's a 21-point swing, if, if you go second. But wait, there's more, because I am playing against Votan with Lay Claim which means that Greg is able to then get 
all of his lay claim objectives as well, because again, I've had to expose myself to try and get any prime return five. And that means Greg gets another 15 victory points. Combine that with the fact he was able to raise some banners and also grind them down. And in the final turn of the game, Greg scored 44 victory points. That's completely and utterly insane. There should be no game scenario where that can happen. I mean, I've seen big swings before. I've seen Harlequin players able to pick up 21, 22 points in the final turn of the game. That's a reasonable amount of extra points for you to get if you go second. It allows you to catch up on maybe losing some of your army to a turn one alpha strike. But 44 points... Jeez Louise. I mean, let me put this overall in context. By the end of the game, end of turn five, I had managed to score 70 victory points. It's not a huge amount, but on a mission where both players tend to struggle with a bit of primary, it's actually a respectable score. And I have won games on missions where you have to hold two with actually less than that. So 70 points was, I thought, pretty good. Greg at that time was on 46 points going into his turn five. So I thought, okay, there is a 20 four point difference there I have a really good chance of being able to actually just win this game by like one or two points because I expected him to get based on his prior experience you know maybe 20 extra points but I thought 24 that's a good lead a 24 point lead going into turn five I thought was pretty good oh boy was I wrong so the final score ended up being 90 points to the Votan and 70 points to the guard and I just want to say by the way guys that this game could have gone completely differently if I hadn't played someone as experienced and competent as Greg. He played the mission perfectly. He had an army that could take advantage of going first or second. I have been in scenarios before, and I've done it myself before, where I've got overexcited and I've gone, you know what, upon sight of the enemy, I advance, sir. That's my style, sir. And I just pushed everything out. And Greg could have done that. He could have tried to get into the firefights early. He could have tried to be overly aggressive. He could have used that pre-game move on his bikers, whether he went first or second. It didn't matter. But he played it well. He was cagey. He picked his fights. He didn't overexpose things. And he basically waited the game out till turn five. He just hung on the ropes, let me put himself out on him. And he just took advantage of the fact that he knew, he was experienced enough to know, that even though he was really far behind on points going into turn five, that he had yet to play his best card. And he knew that he was going to get those 15 points for late claim. And he knew about the extra points for over and all that kind of good stuff. So he played the game exactly the way he should have done. For me, I would love to do a rematch with Greg. And exactly the same mission, exactly the same scenario. But I'd like to know what he would have done differently if he had won that roll off. To go first. I also want to do a shout out to Greg because it turns out that he's actually a follower and supporter of the channel and he was a really lovely guy to play against. It was great to finally be able to put a face to the name that I've seen popping up in the comment section all these years. So Greg, it was a pleasure to meet you buddy. Fantastic game and I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Now before we get into game number five, I want to briefly address the elephant in the room and I'm not talking about your mother. I want to talk about the fact that some people are going to be thinking right now, Morning Glory, you just spent 20 odd minutes talking about a game of 40k and you didn't mention any dice rolls or any turn by turn activities. This was intentional because I wanted to use this game as an extreme example of something that I think is really a big problem for 40k at the moment. And that is going second is too strong of an advantage. Back in the day, going first was better because you could get the drop on your opponent, you could do an alpha strike and that was brilliant. But that's gone now. Terrain is so dense. People don't ever expose any part of their army if they don't have to. And that means going first often is a waste of time. And going second gives you loads and loads of extra points. Look, to put it simply, you shouldn't have two players rolling off at the beginning of the game hoping that they lose the roll off. That just shows that shit's fucked. So I really hope that Games Workshop either addresses this at the end of 9th edition just to see the edition out or it's something they fix going into 10th edition. But here we are, my little conscripts, game number five, the final game of the event, the end game if you will, Marvel please don't sue me, and I was taking on Jack and his Dark Angels. 
Now, naturally, when I saw I was playing against Dark Angels, when the pairings went up at the end of round four, I assumed that I would be playing against all of them Deathwing. I mean, Dark Angel, Terminator, Spam, so hot right now. But actually, it turns out that I wasn't playing against Terminator Spam, and Jack had a really, really cool list. In fact, this might have been my favourite list to play against over the course of the whole event. Because it wasn't the Stompy Boys that I was facing off against, it was them Speedy Gits, the Ravenwing. And what's even cooler is it wasn't even a load of Ravenwing bikers, it was actually all of the different kinds of land speeder. Specifically, Jack had two Ravenwing Talon Masters. These guys are insane. They're land speeders that come with twin assault cannon and twin heavy bolter. And I think the dude's got a power sword as well, so they're pretty decent in combat. They always hit on twos, and they are characters which have got less than eight wounds, so you can't even target them. Honestly, if I was a Deathwing player, or a Dark Angel player, I should say, I would still take just three of these things and just smash them in every single list. They just look amazing. So we had two of those. He then had two little infiltrator squads, a unit of company veterans, a couple of Deathwing command squads, just uh, two Terminators in each one, a Ravenwing champion, that was the biker boy from Mars. He had three land speeder tornadoes in a squadron, each one of those with a assault cannon and multi-melt, so able to deal with infantry and tanks alike. He had two of the Land Speeder Vengeances with the Heavy Bolters, and he had three Storm Speeder Thunder Strikes. So a lot of light armor, a lot of maneuverability, but he seasoned this with a bit of heavy support. Embodying the floaty tank vibe of the list, he went for two Gladiator Reapers, and I can't believe these things are only 150 points. They're fantastic. And he also went for a Thunderfire Cannon, giving him just a smidge of indirect fire, a vital part of any good list, in my opinion. Like I said, I really liked this list. I thought it was very cool and unique, not something I'd ever played against before. And in Jack, I felt like there was a kindred spirit. We'd both turned up to a big tournament with a very popular, powerful faction. But neither one of us had brought the meta netlist. Instead, we had brought something a bit more Johnny Rambo. Now, the mission for game number five was tear down their icons, which is a five objective mission. And in terms of secondaries, I actually went for Boots on the Ground and Inflexible Command. I know, surprise, surprise, please pick yourself up off the floor. But I actually went for something a little bit different. For my third secondary, I went for Bring It Down. Now, I thought about retrieving Dem Datas, but I figured he's got so much maneuverability that if I try and retrieve data, he could just screen me out with a land speed here, a little Terminator command squad there. So I thought that retrieving the data probably wouldn't get me more than eight points if I was lucky. Whereas in terms of bring it down, he's got all the Gladiator Reapers, he's got all of the vehicles. I can pretty much max that out. Now for Jack's secondaries, he went for Codex Warfare, no prisoners and raise the banners. I know some of you will be raising an eyebrow there instead of a banner and going, surely he should have taken Oath of Moment. His list isn't really built around that. Think about it. Oath of Moment is better if you can take big blocks of stompy terminators and move them into the middle of the board and just sit there getting punched in the face but scoring points. Jack's list doesn't work like that. It's speedy. It's fast. It's got a furious amount of firepower, but it's incredibly fragile. If he moves all his speeders into the middle of the board, all his speeders are just going to die. Moving on to deployment, and I was able to implement my standard deployment protocol. Oh, I felt like putting on a comfy pair of slippers after that last game. 30 infantry behind each central ruin, and all of my tanks and mortars at the back. The Dark Angel deployment was pretty interesting. So Jack broke his force down into multiple smaller strike forces, able to attack me from multiple different angles. He went for a Talon Master on each flank, supported by one of the Ravenwing Land Speed of Vengeances. And he also supported each one of those Talon Masters with a Deathwing Command Squad, able to just extra cow to protect them. He also had his company veterans on one of his flanks as well. And then in the center, he put his three normal land speeders, the tornadoes with the multi-bells assault cannons, and he also put his land speeder thunder strikes, the bigger ones with all the missiles and the last cannons and stuff like that. In reserve, he put both gladiator reapers. This was pretty good because it meant that I couldn't just hop from one ruin to the next because he would just come in from reserve and then start blasting me. And then he also put his two units of infiltrators 
up forward. He infiltrated them early on. And his plan was to basically get those infiltrators onto the middle objective, use the fact that he's spaced for me so it becomes a sticky objective for him, and then basically keep me off that objective the rest of the game, even if his infiltrators then die. His Thunderfire Cannon was at the back behind his big L-shaped ruin. Of course it was. It was basically doing the same thing that my mortar was, just you know, lobbing rounds into the middle of the board. It then comes over to who's going to get the first turn, and I win the roll-off again. And like with the other games in this tournament, winning that roll-off basically means that I don't have a huge amount to do in my first turn, but it does make it nice and quick. What I do in my first turn is I take one of my infantry squads that are in the bottom right of my deployment zone, the ones you can see right now on the screen, and I just move, move, move them. But I don't go the auto advance six, I just use the extra two inches of movement. And I move and move them, and they go over the halfway line into the enemy territory, and they are able to plant a bomb. Because my plan for this game was basically try and get an equal amount of secondary and normal primaries, but win the game on having a couple of bombs planted. Because I have more obsec than my opponent, and it's easier for me to plant bombs all over the place than it is for him to do so. Now that was in the south and the bottom right, but in the top left, in the north, I actually ended up moving out 20 infantry and a death corps marshal to take an objective. I'm trying to set myself up for some extra primary points turn two. Also, if Jack does end up going after those infantry, it might cause him to overexpose one of his land speeders, and I might be able to get some bring them down points as well. Now, in the center is where most of my shooting happens. There's not too much of it, though, because most of his army is hidden. However, one of my battle tanks is able to poke around the corner and get a cheeky shot off onto his infiltrators. And I do manage to do a little bit of damage to that squad, but unfortunately, due to some low dice rolls on my end and the fact that these guys do have a medic, most of the damage is absorbed and I end up killing one or two of them. I lay all of my mortars into the same squad, but they're on a three-up save. That can go either way, and unfortunately, I don't quite wipe them out, leaving one or two of them left alive. We then get into Dark Angel's turn one, and Jack starts off by countering that infantry push in the north. He uses a Talon Master just poking its nose out of terrain to just obliterate one squad, and then the unit of land speeder tornadoes that were in the center of his deployment zone zip over from one ruin to the next, and they're able to draw line of sight on the other infantry squad, and between their three assault cannons, they just shred the other infantry squad leaving my marshal looking very lonely on that objective by himself. But the Dark Angels had zoomed one of their land speed of vengeances onto that objective. They'd gone for the full advance, and that meant that it was one obsec model of his, the land speeder, versus one obsec model of mine, the marshal, on that objective, denying me those primary points going into my turn two. Now, in the center, Jack did a really smart move. What he did is he took his shattered infiltrator squad and he moved those onto the objective. Because he space marines, that was now a sticky obsec objective for him. He then took his other five-man squad of infiltrators and he moved them forward and he charged my infantry that was hiding behind the ruin. Now, he was never going to win that fight. It was 20 infantry of mine versus five of his. I mean, no one was going to win that fight in melee. It was just a bit of a slap fight. But what he was doing was he was slowing me down. It meant that I couldn't just move and move one of my squads onto that objective and take it off him. And the cherry on top is he hit the third infantry squad that was hiding behind that central ruin with the Thunderfire Cannon, with Tremor Shells, halving its movement and advance, meaning there was no way I was going to be able to get onto that middle objective, guaranteeing that Jack was going to get eight primary points in his turn two. And in the south, Jack took his two company veterans and he moved them onto the objective and raised the banner. At the same time, he used his land speeder Talon Master to pick up my infantry squad that had planted the bomb. But that was okay, they'd already done their job. Going into turn two, and I knew that Jack had the initiative. It was clear to me that a lot of his firepower could just poke its guns around things and pick up infantry and get the angles that they needed, or it was the talent masters and he could just sit them out in the open and I still wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So I needed to focus on denying Jack as many points as I could. Right now, he was sat on three objectives. I needed to do something about that. In the south, in the ruin that now housed 20 infantry, I move, move, moved another squad. This time, I went the full 12 inches, and I put them onto the objective that had his banner and his company veterans on. 
I ended up tearing that banner down and I denied Jack that prime objective, meaning he wasn't going to get the big 12 going into his turn two. I then used one of my battle tanks, I believe it was the gatekeeper one, to pick up the company veterans that were on that objective, removing one of the squads he could use to raise banners with. Now, in the center, it was mostly me just dealing with and reacting to Jack throwing those infiltrators at me. So I failed my infantry back and I kept them behind the line of sight blocking terrain, really just consolidating the what was about 20 or so infantry I had left over there. I then used one of my plasma tanks to blow away that infiltrator squad that had charged me and tied me up. And I used my mortars to pick up the two infiltrators that were sat on the middle objective. That meant that his infantry threat and again, more of his banner units had been taken out of the game. In the north, there was a little bit more action going on. I took my other plasma Lehman Russ and I gave it the tank order to be able to move move an extra two inches and advance and still be able to shoot as if it counter stationary. It's called full throttle. And I yeeted that tank really far up and that allowed me to get the angle I needed to just see the little nubbin of the one of the land speeder tornadoes that had been multi and assault canning my infantry on the, that top left objective. I fired the whole tank into that squadron Obviously, I didn't have any reroll ones, so it was a bit less than I would normally get, but I was still able to kill one and a half of those land speeders, which is pretty great. My remaining firepower that I had available to me between the Vanquisher and the regular battle cannons, I was able to destroy the land speed Avengers that was contesting the objective with my marshal. Sure, that land speeder had denied me for primary points, but it had still given me two secondary points for bringing it down. So at least I still got something out of that flank. Despite only getting four primary points, turn two was actually a pretty decent scoring round for me. I still got two points for destroying that big land speeder, and I also was able to get three points on boots on the ground because I had move and move one of my infantry squads onto the enemy objective. I had them in the north as well, behind the ruin, and of course I had you know, my mortars and stuff in the in my own table quarter. And I also got five points of flexible command because all of my tanks were in range, all of my infantry in range, and my vox casters with like conga lining and whatnot. And then I was able to destroy that land speed of vengeance with the tanks who were under the influence of orders. And I was also able to destroy those infiltrators with the mortars that I'd had take aim. So I had multiple layers of flexible command operating. So overall, a pretty good scoring round. And the best bit is I had managed to deny Jack quite a few points. I tore one of his banners down. I denied him four primary points as well. Turn two for the Dark Angels comes around and Jack continues to play it very smart and very cagey. He takes his two land speeders that are in the center, the two smaller ones, and he just moves them into the gap between the two ruins in my deployment zone in the north. This essentially blocks my movement out of my deployment zone with my tanks and it keeps a lot of my firepower pinned back. And he's only feeding me units that he wants me to kill. That he doesn't mind losing. And then in his charge phase, he takes those two land speeders and he tags two of my infantry squads that are hiding behind the ruins. Again, stopping me from being able to take that middle objective off him. And again, he uses that Thunderfire Cannon with those tremor shells to slow down the third squad. Basically, I've got 30 infantry whose whole job has been to hide behind the ruin and just take that objective off my opponent every opportunity they get. And they're just not getting to do that at all. In fact, spoiler alert, they never get that middle objective. In the south, his protected Talon Master mows down another squad of infantry, the ones that were holding that objective in the bottom right. But he's not able to raise a banner on it. And he doesn't even try because he has to control that objective to be able to raise a banner. And the only units he's got there are his two Terminators from the command squad. And they are not going to out obsec me on that objective. So he basically just contents himself with clearing away one of my squads. And he knows he's going to have to raise that banner later on. In the north... He uses his other talent master to just pick up my marshal. Now, that was a slight mistake on my end. I had meant to move the marshal back behind the ruin, but I hadn't done so. And in the end, I just ended up leaving it. I didn't ask Jack for me to take it back or anything because I figured, hell, if the marshal somehow 
survives in that objective, it does get me more primary. So it wasn't the end of the world. But I basically lose one of my marshals to a little bit of a pigheaded mistake in the north. And that is basically turn two for the Dark Angels. I should have mentioned that those land speeders that were move blocking me and tanking my infantry, they had actually shot their multi melters and assault cannons into one of my Lehman Russes and had actually successfully killed it. So I was one battle cannon Russ down going into my turn three. But speaking of turn three, let's go into the guard one now. And I know at this midpoint of the game that it's starting to slip away from me. I know that if I'm not careful, Jack is going to get another eight primary points. I only got four in my turn three because once again, I'm just sat on my home objective. And I know that I'm not achieving many bring it down points because I've only killed one big speeder. Sure, I'm going to kill that little squadron of little speeders as well, but... That's not a big deal. My opponent still got his gladiators to come in. My engineers have to come in this turn. Oh, it's just, it's not in my favor right now. And if I keep playing at KG, the game's just going to fall away from me over the course of five turns and I'm not going to lose. So I decide it's time for boldness. Fortune favors the bold. So what I do is I take my other battle cannon, Lehman Rust, the one that's in the south, and I... Give it the order to count as being obsec. So my vehicle is now objective secured. I take that tank and I advance it. I have to do the CP reroll, but I advance it. And I manage to get it into the center of the board. This finally unstickies that middle objective and it takes a little bit of pressure off because I know Jack's only going to get four primary points in his turn. I then also take one of my engineer squads, they tunnel up in the middle of the board behind one of the ruins, behind landslide blocking terrain, and they start deploying the bomb. Now they're in a relatively safe position there. My opponent is unlikely to be able to target them with anything. There is a Thunderfire cannon, but remember, they are not obsec, which means they are going to have to survive a full turn in the middle of the board to be able to deploy that bomb. But if they pull it off, it will get me four extra victory points. Now in the south, I go to move out my third infantry squad that's behind that room, my final one. And then I stop myself and I go, there's no point in moving the squad out. My opponent doesn't control that objective. He didn't move anything onto it in his turn. There isn't a banner on that objective either. All I would be doing is throwing 10 guys forward to die. And I've only got 10 left, so that's not a good idea. So I actually husband them and I keep them behind the wall in the ruin. And they just stay safe for a turn. They wait for opportunities to come up later on. The added advantage of them being right up against that wall is it did mean that any strategic reinforcements that uh, Jack brought in wouldn't be able to get close enough, wouldn't be able to quite get the angle that they needed to be able to target my engineers. I mean, the only thing that he would have to deal with them is the Thunderfire Cannon. In the north, my remaining infantry, about 15 blokes across three squads, fall back from the land speeders, consolidate behind the landslide blocking terrain, waiting for opportunities, turn four, turn five. And the two land speeders get blown away by my combined Russ firepower. And that's basically my turn. Not a huge one, but I'd set myself up for a big turn four, turn five. I had my Russ in the center. He's going to have to deal with that because it's obsec. I'm deploying a bomb, which isn't going to get me points this turn, but it's unlikely that Jack's going to be able to deal with them with one Thunderfire cannon. So that's another sort of four points kind of in the bank. And once again, I continue to get three boots on the ground points. And I also managed to get my inflexible command points as well. So all of my secondaries are ticking up. I'm just struggling a little bit on primary. Turn three for the Dark Angels comes along and this is where the game changes. This is where the balance of power shifts because Jack decides he's going to go all in. He's going to deliver the killing blow. He's played at KG for a couple of turns and now he wants to start doing some proper damage to my army. He needs to deal with that Lehman Russ in the center because if he doesn't, that's going to give me four victory points. But he also has to bring his Gladiator Reapers in. Now, to go after the Russ in the center, Jack brings his three Storm Speeders and he puts them into one of the ruins, but they're touching the ruins so they can see through the wall and have a good fire angle onto the Russ. He then takes his remaining Land Speeder Vengeance and he pokes it around the corner and he does exactly the same thing. So it's touching the ruin so I can see it but also it can see my Lehman Russ in the center of the board. 
He then brings one Gladiator Reaper in the far north. And it's turn three, so he can come in anywhere he wants on that long table edge in the north. And he uses it to get an angle on my infantry that thought they were safe, hiding behind the line of sight blocking terrain in the middle. Those infantry just cannot catch a break, man. And he brings his other Gladiator Reaper in the south, but he can't bring that quite as far along because obviously I've got my infantry squad in that room pushing him back a bit. And so he can't really get very many viable targets with them. So he decides to just have that Reaper put supporting firepower into the Russ in the center. He then takes his Ravenwing Bike Master and he turbo boosts and moves it forward into that gap in the north between the two ruins, once again, blocking my Russes from getting out of their deployment zone. In the shooting phase, things kind of go as you would expect. I've got four anti-tank land speeders, a plasma land speeder, and a gladiator with all of the DACA unloading into one Lehman Russ. But I do make Jack work for it. I spend a CP for smokescreen and I spend two CP on ablative plating because I hadn't spent that much at this point, so it's really been building up. And I just make that rust very, very durable. And interestingly, it comes down to the very last shots from that Gladiator Reaper. If I'd had a CP reroll, I very well may have survived that Lehman Rust. Unfortunately, I roll exactly the number of fail saves that I need to. He does exactly the amount of damage that he needs to. And he does manage to destroy that Lehman Russ. Fortunately, it didn't blow up. The Thunderfire Cannon tried to go after the engineers, but it only killed one of them, which wasn't enough to do any damage to them, make them fail morale or anything like that. They had a four up save against Thunderfire Cannon, which is quite nice because they've got that car pace armor on. And in the north, that gladiator drew a bead onto the infantry, it split its fire, and it successfully wiped out pretty much all of the 15 remaining blokes that were trying to hide behind that line site blocking terrain. They had a really tough game of it. They got tied up pretty much the whole game, and then when they finally did get an opportunity to move out in turn four, turn five, they just got shredded. So those 30 infantry were very well countered by Jack. Now, going into turn four, you might think that the guard were in a bit of a tricky situation. We had lost nearly all of our infantry. We had 10 in the north hiding behind a ruin, 10 in the south hiding behind a ruin. And we'd lost two of our Lehman Russes. But unfortunately for the Dark Angels, they had made a fatal, and I mean fatal mistake. They had exposed themselves to a guard gun line. And I still had... Four Lehman Russes. I still had all of my mortars and I still had a hell of a lot of firepower at my disposal. Now, most of my movement consisted of getting my Lehman Russes the perfect firing angles. I still had that annoying bike dude in the way, but I basically moved my Russes just to stay an inch away from him, but into the ruins so they could see everything that they needed to. Because once they're in the ruins, they can see through the ruins. I then moved on to the shooting phase and I started off by taking my infantry squad at that end was in the north and I put everything into the Talon Master. Turned out I might as well not bothered firing everything because I just fired the melter gun first. It got an auto wound. My opponent failed a save and I got a big six on the damage and I was in melter range. So eight damage and that bike guy just evaporated and that really set the tone for my turn four. I then took the Vanquisher. And I took the Vanquisher and I put all of its shots into the Gladiator in the north. Now I fired things like the Heavy Bolters and the Lads Cannon first, which were successfully able to chip off two or three wounds from the Gladiator. I then fired the Vanquisher Cannon and I rolled a big fat one. But fortunately, because I am elite sharpshooters and I have got Veteran Commandeer, I was able to re-roll that dice. And I re-rolled it into a big fat six. This auto wounded the Gladiator which then proceeded to go straight through its armor save, which then proceeded to do 6 plus D3 damage plus D3 mortal wounds. And I got a big 6 on the number of wounds and a big 6 on the mortal wounds, popping that gladiator in one shot. The Vanquisher really got to show off what it could do in a tank v tank duel this turn. I then took Gatekeeper and he went into the gladiator in the south. And I put ingrained precision on him and I rolled the number of shots for his gun and he got a big five. Now, because it's gatekeeper, he gets six plus D three shots, which means even though he rolled a five, he still got the big nine shots. Nine gatekeeper shots turned that gladiator into a smoking crater. There was nothing left. So two of my opponents, big tanks are now down. 
It then came down to the Land Speed of Vengeance and the Storm Speeders. Now, the Land Speed of Vengeance, interestingly, was actually only on about two wounds because I had been doggedly mortaring it for basically turns two and turns three. And so it came to turns four and my mortars were like concentrate fire and they just took the last two wounds off that, uh, off that Land Speed of Vengeance. This meant that I had two Plasma Russes that could see three land speeder storm strikes and they unleashed hell now i didn't roll a huge amount of shots i got i think six shots from both lehman russ's plasma turrets but i rolled to hit and i hit and i rolled to wound and i wounded and i don't think i dropped a hit or a wound between those two Russes that turn. They had really been waiting for their time to shine. Their crews were so frustrated that they had been move blocked for three turns. They were like, you know what? No more. We are going to take away all of this move blocking shenanigans in one fell swoop. And I basically destroyed all three of those land speeders with my plasma Russes. I think maybe one of them was left alive on two wounds, but it just got picked up in turn five at the beginning with my remaining mortars. And so suddenly, my opponent has gone from having the majority of his armor intact to the end of turn four, the only land speed he's got left on the board are his two talent masters. I absolutely destroyed them. I bombed them back to the dark age of technology that they love so much. And unfortunately for my opponent, that was basically game. He had nothing left he could come back at me with that. He had a couple of Dark Angel Terminator squads that in his turn four waddled out onto objectives to try and raise banners. And I just blew them off those objectives and used my remaining 10 infantry to tear those banners down. And then in my opponent's turn five, he basically had two land speeder storms and a Thunderfire cannon. That was it. What really stood out for me in that sort of turn four, turn five exchange was that the Dark Angels have got a lot of firepower and when they can concentrate it, they can take on enemy heavy tanks. But they themselves are not heavy tanks. And if they try and get into a straight up firefight with some dedicated main battle tanks, they are going to have a really bad time. They're going to lose that firefight. And that's exactly what happened. But that's not to say that Jack didn't give it a really good go. He spent his turn four, turn five, scrabbling around, getting as many points as he could. He was able to defuse one of my bombs as well. And the final score was very close. It was 68 points to the Dark Angels and 71 points to the Guard, meaning that I was just able to win that game by three points. And I have to say, this was one of the most enjoyable games of 40k I have played in a really long time. It was definitely a game of cat and mouse, play and counterplay. It was anyone's game right all the way up until that turn four. And both players had their tactical and strategic brains turned on and it just made for a very satisfying 40k competitive experience. So that was the end of game number five, the end of day two and the end of the tournament. I ended up getting four wins and one loss over the course of the event and thanks to the fact that I had scored pretty highly in most of my games, even the one that I lost, I ended up coming 33rd out of 258 players. Not too bad if I do say so myself and a new personal best for me at any super major event. But before we end today's video, I just wanna go over some final thoughts. So starting off with the list, it performed exactly how I expected it to. The level of redundancy built into this thing was fantastic. Pretty much every single game that I played, my opponent said, Oh my God, he just keeps coming. He, there just keeps being more guardsmen. Whether that was infantry running out of walls, whether that was tanks emerging from behind ruins, I always seem to have the numbers advantage and thanks to that, the firepower advantage over my opponents. What's kind of interesting is that I had not done any practice games with this list before I took it to the Super Major. Now, normally that is a cardinal sin and I strongly advise anyone watching this video to make sure you do get some practice games in with your armies before you go to events. But the thing is, I wasn't running some sort of weird and wacky combination or a meme list. I was just using staple fundamental guard units, infantry and tanks and mortars. So whilst I hadn't used this specific list before going to the event, I have used many lists like this over the course of many years. So it was just like putting on a comfortable favorite jumper.
In terms of the tournament and the competitive meta itself, I just want to draw your attention to one interesting observation that I made over the course of the event, which was the factions that were getting into the top tables. Rather differently for me, I actually spent most of the event near the top half of the tables, and my final game was actually on table 14. And when I looked around me, there was consistently the same factions battling it out. There was Guard, there was Gene Silicult, there was Votan, there was Marines, and there were Demons. And wherever I looked, those factions were basically fighting. And all of the other factions, like Dark Elder, Elder, Necrons, the majority of Xenos stuff, not including Votan, was way down in the bottom half. And the further you got into the bottom half of the event, the less likely you were to see armies like Guard or Marines or Gene Silicon. And the more you started seeing things like Tyranids and all of the other alien factions as well. Rather sadly, I don't actually recall seeing any Chaos Space Marine players there. I'm sure there must have been one or two, but I had a good look around the tables, just enjoying the atmosphere of the event, and I don't remember seeing any. Likewise, I think I saw one Necron, and weirdly, there wasn't as much Tau there as I expected. Tau have been a mainstay of tournaments for a long time, and yet I think I can remember on one hand how many Tau players I actually saw there. I guess what I'm trying to say is, whilst the tournament scene is more alive than it ever has been, there are so many events you can go to. If I wanted to, I could go to a new tournament every single weekend. And we're not just talking local ones, we're talking like big GTs and stuff like that. But whilst the competitive scene overall is doing well, it feels like certain factions are just becoming the mainstay, of being the ones that we see every single time. And other ones are almost becoming extinct on the tabletop. And you really notice that when you're playing at tournaments because you get that concentrated 40k experience over the course of a few days. And at the last two events that I've been to, that's 10 competitive games in a row, I have played against Power Armor or Power Armor Equivalent. It's been three up saves for days. I'm talking to the last event, I faced two World Eater players, a Grey Knight player, a Custodes player, and a Dark Angels Deathwing player. This event, I obviously played against the Imperial Knights, They've got a three-up save. They're pretty, pretty tanky. And then I played Custodes, and then I played Votan, and then I played Votan again, and then I played against Marines in the final game. I just haven't played against Xenos, like proper Xenos. I'm not including Votan in that in ages. And I haven't faced against a Guardsman equivalent or a Horde army in what feels like forever. So if you're watching this video and you're thinking of going to taunts in the future, I would definitely gear your armies towards facing down elite infantry. Bring all the plasma and melter you can get your hands on. You might come across the occasional guard player, they are fairly popular on the scene, but most guard players aren't doing what I do and bring 90 infantry. Most are bringing 40 to 60 infantry, including some Kazakin. And so that really doesn't take a huge amount of firepower to lift up. Any sort of spare bolts you've got is more than enough anti-horde to deal with that amount of infantry. And on that final remark, we're going to end today's video. Thank you for watching. I really hope that you have enjoyed it. If you have, please consider smashing that like button and also subscribing to never miss an episode. If you found today's video particularly fun or interesting or informative, then consider becoming a channel member or Patreon supporter. Channel membership and Patreon is the lifeblood of this channel and it allows me to do this gig full time now, which means I can go to more tournaments and produce more of these videos. So if you want to see more tournament reports, please consider doing your part and becoming a channel member today. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.